What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Nara and Uzumaki? Part 6. Like share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Let the ordinary bandits with their weapons not hold out long against a chakra user, but they will manage to alert the missing mean. And the sneaky genin who tagged along with us will help them with that. Though, we approached not from Kanoha's side where he was keeping watch, but from the opposite. Sensei, where are the other nuke mean? I quietly asked into the microphone, pressing the communication button on the radio. Kanade had given us their positions just before we approached the camp and showed us how to use it, promising dire consequences if anything broke. Usually, Shinobi didn't use such devices, relying on sign language instead, but since we had only just begun to learn it, we had to use makeshift means that increased the risk of detection. The second genin is sleeping in the center of the camp, but I can't locate the chunin, I heard a slightly annoyed voice from our instructor, though the central tent prevents me from seeing inside, blocking my Byakugan with some barrier, so he's definitely in there. It's an Uzumaki contraption, Sensei, I informed her, before, you could buy them without any issues, so almost any shinobi with money could afford to acquire such an item. Such tents were specially invented by sealing masters to conceal their chakra during campsites and reduce the risk of detection by sensors. Unfortunately, this also applied to my senses, so I could barely detect the presence of the barrier around the tent, despite my heightened sensitivity. It was also fortunate that such techniques were designed for Uzumaki Chakra and not ordinary Shinobi, otherwise, I might not have felt it at all. After all, the Hyuga clan had some advantages over ordinary sensors simply due to their vision. Any other information we need to know about this barrier? I asked. The barrier muffles sounds and chakra only in one direction, meaning once we start our attack, all its inhabitants will hear us and feel the techniques being used. Not to mention, there might be more than one Chunin inside. So, we might run into a lot more Nuke Nin than the ANBU discovered, a slightly nervous voice from Inazuka chimed in. That possibility exists, acknowledged the Sensei, but considering that both Ryu and I can be counted as full-fledged Jonin, our chances of survival are much higher than a regular Genin team. Not to mention a small backup plan just in case. Hmm, is she hinting at the ANBU who just caught up to us, settling in about 30 meters above? What's the plan? I inquired, throwing a quick glance at the branches where my teammates were hiding. Right now, the main thing is not to let them get anxious, it could end up being a disaster. Since this is your baptism of fire, you'll be the ones to clean up the camp, declared Huga, interrupting a couple of disgruntled exclamations, you're capable of it, so no objections. I'll take care of the genin on watch and then simply monitor the situation in case of any unexpected turns. You'll start by hitting the camp with combined techniques, then deal with any surviving bandits and nuke nin. Ryo, as the strongest chunin, you understand? Yes. Excellent. And remember, these aren't people, they're scum who rob, rape, and kill innocent civilians. The world will be cleaner without them, so don't hold back, we won't take prisoners. Now, let's go. Obeying our instructor's command, our trio quietly slipped down from the trees and glided across the ground, heading towards the camp while preparing techniques on the go. Creating a shadow clone beside me, I still managed to sense Kanade vanish with Shunshin and appear next to the genin on watch. Moments later, the sensation of his chakra sharply diminishing signaled his demise, but there was no time to dwell on that. Katan, Goka Mekyaku. Katan, Goka Mekyaku. Katan, Goka Mekyaku. Futan, De Tapa. I exhaled sharply, pouring as much chakra as possible into the technique, followed by three fiery orbs. I recently acquired this technique from a shinobi who returned from Suna. A couple of weeks of training in the team, and we managed to pull off combinations at the level of A-rank techniques. 
Not bad for recent academy graduates. Of course, I can push myself to A rank as well, but my predisposition isn't quite suited for such large-scale attacks. Perhaps Catan suits me better than all the others. And while I had to work hard to master techniques of unfamiliar elements, the result is definitely worth it, and I can't complain about a bit of chakra depletion. The resulting wall of fire roared as it rolled toward the camp, unsettling the bandits, and we ran after it, carefully ignoring the brief cries of pain from those caught in the technique. Despite the intense heat that effortlessly turned the grass underfoot to ash, some unfortunate souls were still alive, if one could call them that, charred to blackened stumps, needing our mercy. The horrific smell of burnt flesh only increased our desire to distance ourselves from its source and the persistent need to empty our stomachs. Ishii did just that, taking a few steps back from us after his kunai ended the suffering of yet another charred individual. Glancing approvingly at Tsum's resolute stance, I almost wanted to praise her, but I had to abandon that intention as impending trouble became palpable. Despite the enormous amount of chakra used, I sensed the death of the second genin and a short, powerful surge, indicating the creation of a technique near the center of the camp where we were approaching. Damn it! A huge wave of water, rising from the other side of the wall of fire, crashed into our joint technique. After a couple of seconds of deafening hissing and steam clouds, they mutually annihilated each other, forcing us to halt. What the hell, exclaimed Rotaro, who had rushed up. Indeed, a Chunin wouldn't whip up such a technique in a matter of moments. Without wasting time, I formed the hand seals and took a deep breath. Futon, de tapa. The cloud of steam was successfully blown away from us, generating a chorus of cries of pain and rage. Afterward, we beheld a scene, half-burned camp, ordinary bandits rolling on the ground with screams, thoroughly scalded, and three, figures of enemy shinobi, also affected by the steam but unlike the rest, with only slightly reddened skin. A bit further back, another missing mean rose from the ground, pressing his palms to the right side of his face. In total, four men, with two bearing Kirigakure headbands, one from IWA, and one from Konoha. Naturally, all crossed out. And if the latter two were on the level of Chunin in terms of chakra volume, then the Mist Fellows could pass for full-fledged Jonin. I think the question of who created the Suetun technique so quickly is immediately moot. Feeling the seriousness of the situation, Hyuga appeared from behind, followed by A and Bu in fox masks, stopping slightly to the side of us. Well, well, Kanoha rats have come, what a surprise, casually patted the tallest nuke Nin, whose face was intersected by a jagged scar running from forehead to chin, dangerously close to his left eye, with indentations on his lips. I didn't think amidst a multi-front war, you'd still have enough strength left to clear bandits across the country. I don't think we should fear a team of Jenin and one mask wearer, Aniki, calmly remarked the second, drawing a massive sword from his back, while this unexpected attack did some damage, they won't withstand the four of us. Oh really? However, numerical advantage isn't exactly on your side, intervened the instructor, carefully surveying the opponents with activated Byakugan. Three Jenin, a clone, and two Jonin, chuckled the first one briefly, drawing his katana. Hardly. Oji and Tsushima, handle the kids, Tashi and I will take care of the Jonin and ANBU with the clone. Without wasting time, he dashed towards my direction. Ha, mistaking me for a Jonin, and our sensei for a Jenin? Wahaha. This will be fun to tease about. With a smooth motion, I drew my katana, took a few steps forward and parried the angled strike of the massive sword of the missing Nin who aimed to cleave me in half. From his counter-strike, my opponent easily evaded and even attempted to graze me with the tip of his sword, albeit unsuccessfully. Hmm, you handle your blade well, and strength too, smirked Scarface mockingly, stepping back a couple of paces and keeping a firm grip on his surroundings. It's quite strange that he's engaging in close combat, doesn't he know that only Aburame wear this kind of attire? who are best kept at a distance. And you're not bad either, especially with that Swayton technique, I replied, signaling to the clone behind me to keep track of the others. So, your fiery hands, huh? asked the nuke Nin. Almost, but it was I who blew away the mist, so you can thank me for a free steam bath, I grinned in response, shifting slightly to the right and gripping my katana with both hands. Clearly, he didn't enjoy the sensation as the man roared and with unexpected grace, 
leaped forward, delivering a strike from the side and minimizing my chance to evade. Chuckling, I crouched, turned my katana upside down to catch his blade from below, allowing it to slide across the edge to the hilt, tossing him four meters back. Opportunity. Lunging forward, I slashed horizontally, aiming to capitalize on the situation. However, he managed to block the attack aimed at his neck, even before fully recovering from the previous blow. That's what experience does. Ha, huh, seems like you won't be taken so easily, the nuke mean jumped back a bit, removing his right hand from the hilt to start forming hand seals. Though it was a one-handed technique, I recognized it, so almost mirroring his actions, I thrust my katana into the ground and began forming hand seals too. We finished almost simultaneously. Ninpo, Kirigakur no Jutsu. Futon, Tepidama. A strong gust of wind blew away the spreading mist. Not going down so easily. Cat got your sword skills? I taunted the opponent, gripping my katana and deflecting a thrust towards my abdomen. Seems like rumors about your swordsmen are as inflated as the strength of your shinobi. Right now, you'll find out, grinned the man, quickly glancing behind me. However, I didn't need to look there to assess the situation, feeling the chakra-infused mist spreading in all directions. It was rolling in from behind. Leaping to the side and backward, I tried again to use futon, but the nuke mean clearly anticipated that and didn't give me a moment's respite with constant lunges, resulting in a few deep scratches on my shoulders. The mist reached us, and in that moment, the snake disappeared from view. Now, shall we play by my rules, echoed the disembodied voice across the area. Where should I plant my sword? There are a few places on a person where a strike would be fatal. Ignoring the idiot who froze just 20 paces from me, I quickly formed hand seals with my right hand and brought it to my mouth. The only jutsu I managed to adapt into a one-handed version. Ninpo, Dokujuri. The billowing cloud of deadly poison spat from my mouth almost imperceptibly dissolved into the mist, and I held my breath, even though the poison was harmless to me due to my immunity, a second of weakness could cost a lot, and parried the overhead strike that came crashing down on me. A good kick dispersed the water clone, and the original received a deep wound on its leg from the kunai released from my palm as it tried to approach me from behind. Idiot, if the fog was thirty times more chakra-infused, this technique might have worked, but trying to catch a sensor off guard like this? He won't last long now, though, the paralyzing poison used is absorbed through open wounds, so I'll wait a little longer and then I can finish him off. Baba. The sudden explosion followed by the memories of the destroyed clone made me change my plan of action. And Bushnik was wounded by the second Kirinin and took advantage of the moment to stab Kanade in the back just as she was about to get her Chunin out of Willow. The clone barely had time to switch with her with the help of Kawarimi before the two bastards finished her off. Next thing you know, a little surprise and a couple of properly mangled carcasses are in store, Bunshin Bakatsu rules. Yeah, if I'm going to be able to patch up the wounded, I'm going to have to stop messing around with my opponent. After fending off a couple more attacks and moving a bit to the side, I waited for the right moment and just caught the shinobi in the shadows. Given my slowed down movements, it was a simple matter. What? What the hell? He exclaimed as he froze in his swing. Ninpo, kage main no jutsu, I said quietly. Nara? What the fuck? Harry? I replied, and with one swing, I blew the swordsman's head off. I shook the blood off the blade in one swift motion and put the katana back into its scabbard, releasing the headless body from the shadow trap. The unsupported fog was already beginning to clear, and I was able to determine the position of the wounded without any problems. The freshly created clone went to Huga, who was less injured, while I hurried to the Anbushnik, who was getting the full brunt of the damage. The second clone ran to finish off the still-living Jonin, who was sluggishly cowering on the ground not far from the crater. He was a tough one. The Chunin was almost torn in half, but this one had all his limbs intact. When I arrived, the masked man was lying on his back and moaning weakly, clutching the huge wound that almost separated the man's right shoulder from his body. A couple more minutes and he wasn't alive. Having stopped the main blood loss by clamping the artery and large vessels, I injected the wounded man with painkillers, disinfectants and strengthening agents from the first aid kit, after which I put him to sleep and started cleaning the wound, connecting the shattered bone fragments and splicing the damaged tissues. 
I had done it so many times before that I could heal stab and cut wounds with my eyes closed and in the middle of the night. It took me half an hour, during which my almost unscathed partners managed not only to collect the trophies and the heads of the nuke means, but also to drag the bodies into a pile, pouring earth oil on them and then setting them on fire. The clone had also finished treating the mentor, healing a solid hole in her back and moving her closer. Man, if she'd had a better be a Kugan, she might have seen the stab in the back. How's he doing? The Kunoichi asked, wrinkling her shoulders in pain. He'll run home on his own, but he'll be off active duty for at least a couple of weeks, I sighed, wrapping bandages around his shoulder and hanging the bandage around his neck. Poking my finger into my forehead above the mask, I woke the Anbushnik. To his credit, he didn't jump up and look around, but assessing the lack of pain and restraints, simply lifted his head and looked around. I took some blood-restoring pills out of the first aid kit and made him swallow them, drinking water from the flask. What's wrong with the nuke mean? Was all the shinobi asked. Dead, and we should get back, I answered, helping him up and listing the contraindications for the near future. Nodding, the masked man moved his hand gently, making sure that it was working, nodded to me and in a few jumps disappeared among the leaves. Well, we have our jobs, and he has his. But I remembered his chakra. After waiting for Kanade to speak quietly with his partners, I took the scroll with my nuke nean's heads from the remaining clone and tucked it into my pocket. I wonder how much they get for them, and if the dead deserters are wanted. Ryo? How are you feeling? Hmm, the soul-saving conversations with a couple are over, it seems, now it's my turn. I'm fine, Sensei, you don't need to waste your time on me, I'm not worried about the dead, he waved her off casually. Let's just get out of here quickly. I really don't want to breathe in burning corpses. Are you sure you're okay? Huey's skeptical expression clearly showed she didn't believe me. Absolutely sure. Then let's start heading back. Always ready, I nodded, tossing two scrolls and a belt to the Kunoichi's questioning glance, trophies and heads. The journey back was just as boring and long. Since the clone had already informed Kanade about my encounter, there was no need to recount anything. Not that there was much to report, since the whole skirmish lasted only two minutes. Despite the fact that the nuke mean was a bit faster and stronger than me, after battling Mito, he seemed quite slow and clumsy. Actually, I had become so accustomed to the opponent's immense speed that I managed to anticipate all attacks, avoiding every blow and not getting a scratch. Though, the Nukunin's fighting style relied more on the heaviness and speed of strikes rather than mastery of technique, which allowed me to exploit the defensive openings. And then a combination of poison and Haydn did its job. The guy simply didn't expect that from me and paid for it. Three hours later, arriving at the gates, we checked in with the guards and gratefully entered the village. Despite the relatively early hour, everyone felt tired, more emotionally than physically. So when Huey announced that she would personally report and hand in the mission, we all sighed with relief. Despite being somewhat prepared for what had happened today, even I wanted nothing more than to be home, hug Saya, and just collapse on the couch, indulging in blissful idleness. I was too lazy even to use Shunshin to get to the clan district, so nodding to my partners, I slowly strolled down the street. Ryo, wait. Yes? I sighed, waiting for Ishii. What do you want? Standing next to me, he hesitated for a moment. How do you feel about today's killings? Didn't Sensei already talk to you about it? She did, but I still feel sick, like I'll forever hear the screams of those burning alive. Don't blame yourself, you've just made the world cleaner, that's all, I shook my head. What do you mean? Let me explain with a simple example. Bandits don't become such just to quickly get rich at the expense of others' money, but out of necessity. But in a warring country, such jackals often do more harm than the enemy several times over, impoverishing peaceful residents, killing good workers, robbing merchants, and violating any women they come across. Often, they engage in slave trade. By destroying them today, we allow honest people to live and work peacefully. It's like watchdogs guarding a flock of sheep from wolves. As for nuke means, about 30% of shinobi die at their hands, so by eliminating the gang led by these two Kirinin, we reduce the chances of many children becoming orphans, like what happened to you. Whether it's good or bad, that's for you to decide. After examining Rotaro's lightened face, I nodded contentedly. 
Often, the simplest examples are the most effective. Thank you, if that's the case, it feels much easier, my partner sighed. Well, and if you end up spending the night at a brothel, it'll be even better, I added, pulling out several large bills from my pocket and handing them to the genin who blushed beet red, this is a gift from me and a congratulation on entering adulthood. Go on, pick a couple of the prettiest girls and have a good time, make it a night to remember. No refusals accepted. Chuckling silently, I used Chun Shin, leaving behind Ishii, who was left staring dumbfounded. Hmm, so our young genius successfully went hunting. Although, one couldn't expect less from Mito-sama's student, muttered the ANBU commander, carefully reading Huey's report as she stood rigidly at attention before his desk. Anything else not reflected in the report? Perhaps just how easily Ryo handled the killings, Kanade replied after some thought. No stomach emptying in the bushes like Rotaro or disgusted grimaces like Tsum's, as if it were a routine action for him. Like a veteran of war. Certainly not the behavior of a normal genin. He is indeed a veteran, just not a shinobi but a medical nin, the man smirked, he's seen as many corpses, particularly of allies he couldn't save, as you've never seen. And believe me, that's much worse. So he won't be shedding tears over a dead bandit. Is Ryo so inexperienced that a lot of people are dying, the kunoichi asked with interest. Given her student's discretion and aversion to unnecessary chatter, any information about Ryo's life outside the team had to be obtained with effort. She hadn't even seen Nara's open face once, let alone his partner's. If that were the case, Hishisan wouldn't have clung to the boy with a death grip, buying time for the hospital even during training. Ryo has healed 20 times more people than he couldn't save. And that, given the severe shortage of medicines in recent years of war, is a real feat his colleagues can boast much more modest results. Essentially, at this point, Nara is one of the best medical nin of his rank and could very well be promoted within a year. You're starting to believe the rumors that Ryo Kuen is growing into another brilliant medical nin like Tsunade, sighed Huey. I don't know about brilliant, but we could certainly use more field medics like him, the shinobi squinted cunningly, where one Irionin can't handle it, three or four won't have any problems. Considering Ryo's abilities, keeping him at genin rank is just a pointless waste of resources, Canada shook her head, if he can handle Jonin already, what will he grow into in a few years? And that's why from now on, you'll be hunting bandits and not the strongest nuke nins, gaining experience and team coordination, nodded the commander, then Hokage-sama might just grant all three of you field promotions. Maybe you'll benefit from her generosity too. Phew, practically crawling out of the room, I wiped the sweat pouring down my face with my sleeve and looked with disgust at my slightly trembling fingers. Forget the fingers. I'm going to have nightmares about this at night. At least now I understand why they make men wait outside the delivery room and don't drag them to their wives for moral support. Damn it, I wasn't this nervous even during my most difficult surgery. Well, caught the jitters, newbie? Garo, the Irionin, stepped out after me and sympathetically patted my shoulder, pulling out a cigarette from his robe pocket and enjoying a smoke. After my first delivery, I was out for two weeks and my hand stopped shaking only the next day. Enviously eyeing him, I suddenly overcame the urge to light up, back in my old life, I smoked for a decade before health issues arose. But I'm not starting here either. As for me, let those who already have the knack handle it, not rookies like me who are used to spending all their working hours operating on the wounded, I grumbled, pulling a bar of chocolate from my pocket, brought in at exorbitant cost from Kumo, and fiercely biting into it. Early in my hospital career, I noticed that sweets calm the nerves very well, especially after piecing almost corpses back together. That's what got me through initially, and then it just became a habit. But what can we do if there's still a shortage of staff even now, when part of the field hospital from Suna has returned, shrugged my colleague. Considering that all the Irionin from the main western camp on the front lines against Iwagakure fell first, there will now be an even greater shortage of qualified medics. How many more of us will die before the end of hostilities? Yeah, among the support shinobi on the battlefield, Irionin are the first to be taken out. Well, Kunoichis are fine, just don't hang ordinary civilians, if they do, I'll quit for sure. I sighed wearily. And let Hishisan dance around with her tambourine all she wants, I won't change my mind. 
I've practically developed a moral trauma from such experiences. Oh, you youngsters. Who will work then if everyone's nerves start acting up at any pretext, chuckled my senior comrade. But all my experience is geared towards wounds, not delivering babies. I protested sincerely. I won't be able to chase after women for a week now, I'll be remembering it all day. At this statement, the Irionine choked on smoke, coughed, and started laughing indecently. Angrily eyeing him, I suppressed the urge to smack him on the head. Here I am in distress, and this unpleasant person is mocking me. Garo laughed and seemed about to say something, but then the door to the room opened, and a nurse brought out a swaddled, piercingly crying baby. I wonder where the happy father is? I asked, following the girl with my eyes. If he's not in the grave, then he's at war, replied my colleague. That's usually the case these days. After that, mothers are forced to leave the service and raise their children on a meager allowance or even put them in an orphanage. Yeah, at least a third of shinobi children end up in orphanages after their mothers are discharged. Specifically, this applies to non-clan shinobi. The reason is simple, parents, if both are even alive, don't have the time or means to raise a child. During war, the village's budget only allocates a fixed rate to those fighting on the front lines, sometimes not even covering the costs of the simplest missions. It's like protecting the house should be done for free. Yeah. Alright, Garo Senpai, I'm going to my maimed, fractured, and slashed, and don't call me here anymore, I sighed. I have something in my office that's just right for calming down, and it won't involve drinking, strictly for medical purposes. And age has nothing to do with it. And don't count on it, if there's a difficult case and there aren't enough hands, you'll be the one filling in, as someone with experience, the Irionine called cheerfully after me. At that, I just hunched over and hurried on, maneuvering between the bustling hospital staff, no way am I getting involved. By the way, even though I praise Chakra for allowing the fetus to develop without deformities in almost all cases, the same can't be said for a laboring Kunoichi. Chakra is drawn out of her by the growing child. And if it's not a big deal for women with decent reserves, it can lead to quite unpleasant consequences for weaker or younger mothers, up to severe exhaustion or even death in childbirth. Not to mention the need to reopen all poorly healed wounds and injuries. The oversight of a good medical need throughout the entire pregnancy can mitigate or completely eliminate the consequences, but who will figure out to do that? Unfortunately, medical education in Kanoha leaves much to be desired, and people only go to the hospital for serious injuries or life-threatening situations. So then poor Garo has to bring in extra hands to save the mother's life, by the way, a guy from a side branch of the Uchiha who went into medicine. This time, the Kunoichi will be able to return to duty in a couple of months. In other cases, the term is three times longer. Usually, the result is not so optimistic, serious damage to the chakra vein marks the end of further career. Well, forget all these gloomy thoughts, it's time to improve my nerve health with a stack of liquor. Strictly for medical purposes, as I declare as a doctor. Each time I visited the Senju district, I was amazed by the amount of greenery growing within its boundaries. Dozens of tree species, including fruit-bearing ones, numerous diverse shrubs, both decorative and not so much, various flowers, and other plants, all this magnificence transforms ordinary streets into green alleys that are a pleasure to stroll through. Of course, Kanoha itself doesn't lack greenery, but Hashirama's district goes above and beyond. The main thing is that most of his plantings require almost no care and are very resilient, significantly easing the lives of the local inhabitants. Especially since the Senju clan did not boast large numbers even when a large part of them stopped taking missions or actively participating in wars, preferring to raise a new generation of fighters in the Shinobi Academy. Therefore, the streets of the district are not crowded even during the busiest times of the day, when I usually visited Mito and Kushina. Perhaps it was precisely my admiration for the local beauty that caused me to be caught off guard when one of the passing women suddenly moved behind me and enveloped me in bone-crushing embrace, even by my standards, I simply didn't react in time, being in a relaxed state. What an uncouth young man, passed by without even greeting, a vaguely familiar voice whispered in my ear with reproach, while the hemispheres pressing into my back clearly suggested that their owner differed only slightly from Tsunade in terms of her main assets. 
After a second of contemplation of who this might be, I literally lit up. Linchon, you're back. With this exclamation, I turned around, tightly embracing my childhood acquaintance from the Senju clan and lifting her up, swirling her in the air. Ryo Kuen. Put me down right now, the Kunoichi protested playfully. When did you manage to return to the village? I asked, setting her down and stepping back slightly. I arrived the day before yesterday with the convoy from Suna, Linley reported. Half of the army was granted leave, so I took it too. That's why I haven't seen you around here, even though I visit Kushinachan quite often, I modestly omitted mentioning Mido. Carefully examining the Kunoichi clad in standard Jonan attire, but without a vest, I sadly noted signs of exhaustion on the face and even a certain thinness of my longtime friend, new wrinkles, and folds on the forehead. Apparently, even for such a strong woman, the war had been very challenging. But even in such a state, she remained very beautiful. And you've grown so much in just a few years, Linley smiled, shaking her head. I recognized you only by your hair, it's your distinctive feature. Indeed, we hadn't seen each other for a very long time, since I was quite young. Then the war began, and as one of the elite Jonin, she went to the front, appearing in the village only for short intervals every few days. I've achieved a lot in that time, became a third-degree medical neen, graduated from the academy, joined a team, and even started my own business. I couldn't help but boast. And I've also accumulated several nukneen on my record. What a remarkable young man. Sayasan must be jealous of you, what a talented person you've grown into, Said Senju weakly smiling. And I heard about the new degree from Tsunade, she closely monitors the successes of talented colleagues and emerging talents in medicine. Really? I would never have thought so. Upon closer acquaintance with her, I got the impression that the people surrounding Princess Senju were not interested at all, being something like extras, not as talented as her, just getting in the way. Especially men, not counting the children. By the way, let me take a look at your face, you're all masked up like an aburame, Linley suddenly chuckled and reached out towards me. Before I could even come to my senses, my glasses were snatched off me, and the mask ended up around my neck. Oh, what a handsome fellow you've become. Even more handsome than I expected, when I first saw your chubby, charming face, the Kunoichi chuckled with a satisfied gleam in her eyes. I bet girls hang on your every glance, you handsome devil. And you wouldn't even guess you're just 14. They hang on even when I'm disguised. I grumbled, returning my glasses and mask to their rightful places and suspiciously looking around. Fortunately, there was only one woman nearby in her forties with a child, who paid us no attention. Perfect, there are enough admirers for me at the hospital who have known me practically since childhood. I don't need other girls chasing after me, not just on the orders of clan heads, but on their own initiative too. And here I thought Sasuke's fan club was something the author made up, not a real thing. Ugh. Aha, so that's why you prefer to walk around like this? I get it. Linley smirked, nodding her head. Alright, why are we standing out here, let's go to my place, I'll treat you to some tea, we'll sit and chat. Hmm, it seems the visit to Mido's is cancelled for today, I said, alright, let's go, I'll visit Kushina and Mido another day. My agreement delighted the Kunoichi, she literally lit up with joy, as if she had just shed a burden from her shoulders, and eagerly grabbed my hand, dragging me along. Before I knew it, I found myself at her place, sipping some exotic tea, munching on delicious cookies, and sharing mildly significant news about the village and my life that had occurred during her absence. I noticed that Lily listened to me with evident pleasure, but when it came to her own life, she responded with impersonal generalities and amusing anecdotes from her time in the field. After a while, I finally asked a direct question. And how about, the war? Up until then cheerful and happy, albeit not glowing, Linley instantly deflated and aged 10 years, looking much older than her actual age. Watching this unexpected transformation, I realized at that moment that my friend's entire joy was not just because she had met an old good acquaintance, but also because she wouldn't have to spend a single day alone with her own memories. Pushing aside the cup, I leaned in slightly closer on the couch and reassuringly hugged her shoulders earning a barely noticeable grateful smile. The war? Fighting is incredibly tough, blood, dirt, countless wounded and dying, lucky enough to make it to camp, she leaned slightly against my side, 
as if shielding herself from an unseen chill. In our shinobi profession, death is a constant companion, but in war, it's different, constant deaths of friends and acquaintances, whom you can't help because you're trying not to die yourself, constant tension, waiting for the next strike. Linley fell silent for a moment, gathering herself. And it's not just death or blood, you can get used to those with time, but you can't just get used to the moans and screams of the dying, rotting alive from the sand that gets into their wounds, the effects of various poisons that Suna is famous for. A small scratch can mean preparing a coffin for someone, if there isn't an experienced medical need nearby. Some poisons act instantly, some over time, and even if you manage to get them to camp, there are never enough medical need, and some are left to die or lose a limb just to save their lives, condemning them to a life as cripples. And even during the rare hours of sleep, when there's time to rest, you can't forget or detach, bloody nightmares haunt you, faces distorted in agony of people long dead. Dead friends reproach you for not saving them, dead enemies threaten even from the other side. The only way to forget this nightmare is through drugs, alcohol, and the warmth of someone else's body. But when a like shinobi dies on the next mission, the sight of alcohol makes you nauseous, and smoking grass from Kuzugakure is like signing your own death warrant. All that's left is to lie there, staring blankly at the ceiling of the assigned tent and dreaming of a swift end. Many can't handle it and break down, turning into soulless dolls who don't care whom they kill. Such individuals either die soon or, having survived the ordeal of war, lose the will to live. Cases of suicide are not uncommon. Those who have lost loved ones burn with a thirst for revenge, and then drown their bitterness in drink. War leaves its mark on everyone, whether it's a green chunin or a veteran jonin. But worst of all is the moment when you realize that gradually, you just stop caring. Linley continued to speak for a long time in a hollow voice, describing what war is like, and all I could do was hold her tighter against me and listen, allowing her to vent. There were no tears, but with some sixth sense, I felt that with each word she let out, Senju became lighter. And when she poured out everything accumulated on her soul, she would transform back into the cheerful, lively Linley who I had liked so much long ago. Perhaps that's why Kanoha sees so many eccentrics like Guy and Kakashi after three wars, when there's no one to share your burdens with, it's another way to keep from going insane or coping with losses. Damn ninjas and their secrecy. What's needed here are not self-taught folks like me, but professional psychologists. At least now I understand a bit more why many shinobi prefer to have acquaintances in their environment rather than close friends, it's easier to endure their deaths. Anyway, the clone went home, and I stayed with Linley. Naturally, there was no talk of anything improper, we just slept in the same bed, and I had to play the role of both a teddy bear and a hot water bottle. As my friend later admitted, it was the first day after returning to the village when her nightmares didn't torment her, and she managed to get a decent night's sleep. Glancing at the small playground in front of the shabby grey two-story building, I chuckled. Once again, the children were playing ninja war games. To not disturb them, I jumped onto a branch and in a few leaps across the treetops, which grew literally everywhere in the village, I reached the entrance to the shelter. I found myself in such an establishment not without purpose, I came to make a donation. Of course, it wasn't like I suddenly decided to do charity. No, it all started with a chance encounter with a couple of youngsters who had overexerted themselves a bit in their play and fell right into my path, quite bruised and scratched. At that moment, feeling quite generous after a visit to the Senju district, I treated their injuries and even escorted them home, from where two four-year-old boys promptly fled. Naturally, I didn't expect it to be a shelter. But recalling my own chances of becoming an orphan, I began occasionally visiting the kids and bringing them toys. After some time, I started donating money to provide for the children, once I was convinced of the management's integrity. The reason for this action is quite simple, besides the obvious pity for children who have been deprived by fate, village shelters mainly house rejects or those who have lost both parents that is, the children of ordinary shinobi. Orphans of regular villagers usually find their way to relatives or remain under the care of the merchant guild if their parents were merchants. Given the extremely meager funding of all three existing shelters in general, and especially during wartime, staff and wards barely have enough for food, and only small donations from sympathizers allow such establishments to exist. Granted, my motives weren't entirely altruistic either. 
Just remember the number of talented orphans who joined Kanoha's forces, aiming to try and improve the lives of future shinobi and kunoichi, remaining in their memory as a benefactor. And what's there to hide, there are likely to be personalities appearing in these establishments in the coming years whom I didn't want to see left to fend for themselves, with all the canonical consequences. Off the top of my head, I can name several names, Enko, Kabuto, Nono. And these are just a few of the talented individuals who it would be highly desirable to recruit to my clan or at least to the Nara clan. Persuading uncle in certain cases won't be difficult, especially considering talents like Kabuto's and Anko's, here, even a small recommendation can help. At the same hospital, my word carries considerable weight. Also, personally involving myself in their fate is feasible, taking a bit of time away from training, so to speak, making a beneficial investment in the future generation and a reason to remind myself that life consists not only of missions and training. Moreover, if one ingratiates oneself beforehand, it becomes much easier to fulfill planned acquaintances. After all, a childhood familiar shinobi, regularly donating to the shelter and occasionally playing with the children, will be much more trusted than some obscure guy from a clan making supposedly selfless offers. Good day, is Sasaki-san available? I inquired of the elderly woman, who didn't even flinch at my appearance. Typically, Places like this employ disabled and chakra incapacitated fighters, such as this former Kunoichi who burnt out in one of the battles and lost the ability to use Jutsu due to a severely damaged Kirakukiai, but didn't lose most of her skills over time. Good day, Nara-san, the manager is in her office, the caretaker replied with a respectful nod. Thank you. No need, we should thank you, she smiled back, returning to watching over the children. Not wanting to delay, I opened the entrance door and entered the shelter. Since I had been here several times before, reaching the manager's office on the second floor was no trouble. Knocking and entering upon invitation into the room, I immediately noticed the woman seated behind the desk. A typical lady in her forties with a small ponytail, chestnut hair, and a faint streak of grey already showing, common in Kanoha residents who handle nothing more dangerous than a kitchen knife. Former as well. Five such women work here, caring for nearly 50 children aged 2 to 8. Just thinking about their workload sends shivers down my spine. Considering their meager salary, they practically work for free, driven solely by enthusiasm. And yet, they don't leave. Good day, Sasaki-san, am I interrupting you too much? I nodded my head in greeting. Hello, Ryo Kuen, she greeted warmly, tearing herself away from the papers, offering me a warm smile. I wasn't expecting you this month. Alas, too much piled up, and I simply couldn't find the time, barely scraping by with my schedule, I shrugged. How are the children? Does anyone need medical assistance? Oh yes, I also moonlight as a local healer when needed. Naturally, for free. Thanks to such practice, several older children now wish not to enroll in the Shinobi Academy but to train as healers under, their beloved Ryo and I san Damn, it's nice. Thankfully, no, nothing serious beyond a few bruises and scratches that will heal on their own, she waved her hand dismissively. Except maybe my eye acting up again. In that case, it's time to have a look at it, I responded. The former Kunoichi got up from behind the desk without objections and settled onto the old sofa placed in the corner of the office beside a round coffee table and a pot with a miniature bonsai. Clearly, it was troubling her significantly, as she complied without question, Former ANBU staff aren't accustomed to complaining about their problems and only ask for help when things get really tough. Fetching a visitor's chair, I sat beside the sofa and began the diagnosis after removing the bandage. The eye itself didn't leak after the glancing blow, but it was often inflamed, causing severe pain, as happened this time. Quickly reducing the inflammation, which caused the manager to sigh in relief, I allowed her to rise. The worst part is that local artisans can replace eyes even in field conditions, with minimal preparation and just one field medical kit, but they can't repair a damaged organ containing a more complex mechanism than contracting muscles. Seal the injuries with partial organ function? Yes. Restore a completely non-functioning eye? No. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day.
See you in the next one.